There's a party in the streets of Rome. No one's at work and everyone's celebrating. Two tribunes discover it's because the people are ecstatic about Julius Caesar's defeat of the sons of Pompey. The tribunes tell off the citizens and they remove decorations from statues of Caesar. It's clear that the people of Rome really love Caesar. Caesar and his friends are at a festival where an odd soothsayer warns Caesar to beware the Ides of March. Caesar ignores the old man, thinking he's loopy. Two friends and Roman senators, Cassius and Brutus, meet up. Cassius notices that Brutus has been pretty down on himself. Brutus admits he's conflicted. He loves Caesar, but is worried about him taking ultimate power and turning into a king, which is not what the Republic's all about. Cassius has a plan to get rid of Caesar and butters Brutus up, telling him how noble and popular he is. He reminds Brutus that his ancestors killed Rome's first king. Caesar returns and tells his close friend Mark Antony that he really doesn't trust Cassius. Meanwhile, Casca tells Brutus and Cassius that Caesar was offered the crown three times but refused it. However, he desperately wanted to take it and got angrier each time he had to refuse. That night, Cassius, Casca, and other conspirators who want Caesar dead decide to visit Brutus the next day at his home and try and persuade him to join their group. Cassius forges letters that look like they're from concerned Roman citizens to push Brutus into taking part in the conspiracy. Brutus is very conflicted but won't tell his wife, Portia, even though she begs him. After pacing all night, Brutus finally decides to join the rebellion. Caesar's wife has had bad dreams about his death and tries to stop him from going to the Senate. However, Decius flatters Caesar into attending. At the Senate House, all the conspirators turn on Caesar and each stab him to death. Caesar's last dying breath is to exclaim surprise that his friend Brutus has betrayed him. Cassius is wary of Mark Antony, yet Brutus allows him to deliver Caesar's funeral speech. Mark Antony makes a stirring funeral oratory that manages to subtly turn the whole crowd against the conspirators. By the end of his speech, the mobs are baying for blood. Brutus and Cassius are forced to flee Rome. Now Rome is split. There's Lepidus, Octavius, Caesar's nephew, and Antony on one side, versus Cassius and Brutus and the other conspirators. Both have armies. Brutus and Cassius have a huge quarrel after Brutus condemns one of Cassius's men for corruption. And they also have heated differences over how the money is spent, but they manage to reconcile. When they learn Antony and Octavius's army is approaching, they agree to fight them at Philippi. Brutus gets word that his beloved wife has killed herself rather than live in the same city as Antony and Octavius. He tries to soothe himself with music, but Caesar's ghost appears. The ghost tells him they'll meet again on the battlefield. After the generals trade insults at Philippi, the battle begins. Brutus notices a weakness in Octavius' army and aims to exploit it. Meanwhile, Cassius thinks his best friend has been captured by the enemy and misreads the situation. Thinking all is lost, he asks his servant Pindarus to kill him. Then the tide turns and Antony's army is soon winning. Brutus impales himself on a sword rather than be captured and humiliated. Antony finds his corpse, hailing him as the noblest Roman of them all. He says Brutus should be given a proper burial. He and Octavius return to Rome to celebrate their triumph. (music) 
We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on Julius Caesar, check out our analysis of all the themes within the play.